Oh. Hello, to Hello to everyone who is jumping in. We love to see our superhumans on all of our different live streams. And this morning we have the lovely Seth Lyon with us from Vancouver over in Canada. And it's a reasonable time of the day for him, unlike our earlier speaker, who was 1 a.m. So thanks so much for joining us, Seth. Seth yeah. is a somatic trauma specialist, and his talk today is called Somatic Trauma Resolution as the Foundation for Claiming Life Energy. Now, I love that part of the um, topic because it sounds like to me when you say that, that there's all this unclaimed territory that we have that's making our lives difficult and hard and that we can actually go and claim that all back for ourselves and heal it and make it better. Is that the kind of idea? Absolutely, yeah. And one of the things that um, my wife, who's also in the same field, said a while back is trauma is untapped resource. Oh, I love that. I love that. It's a very important way of looking at trauma, actually. Let's frame it right from the get-go that you know, trauma isn't something to be scared of, although it can be scary to work with. It holds our life energy. And I'll, I'll get into explaining exactly how that happens. But as we heal trauma at the biological level, we actually reclaim our life energy for ourselves so that we can use it to, you know, not just get by, but to actually thrive and have be powerful in the world. So... And you know what, this is so perfect, the timing of your talk, because the lady before you was talking about reclaiming your shadow. Oh. And so I think it's a really similar but different um, way of looking at this topic. So it's going to be really interesting having you back to that. And I'm That's sure you'll great. be very complimentary of each other. Wonderful, wonderful. Okay, it's all yours. So launch into um, sharing with us about um, how we can heal our trauma. Okay, so before I get into how to actually heal it, I need to provide some sort of foundational explanations of what trauma is and also what energy is. What am I, what am I speaking about when I say life energy? Because there's different kinds of energy and I view energy as existing along a spectrum from the energy that pumps the blood through our veins and the energy that fires through our neurons and through our nervous system, which is what I'm calling life force energy. It's a biological energy, all the way to the finest of etheric energies, um, which is what we are working with when we're you know, working with the chakras or with their energetic field. If we're connecting into the crystalline grid of the earth or the telluric grid of the earth, we're working with the more etheric energies. Mm. So I want to be clear that what I'm talking about here is that we need to liberate our biological energy in order to have full effective access to our etheric energy and in order for those etheric energies to be grounded and effective in the world. So that's the first distinction I'll make is that when I'm talking about reclaiming life force energy, I'm talking about our biological energy, the energy that runs specifically through our autonomic nervous system. So, what do I mean by that? And how does trauma mess that up? So to describe that, I have to explain what trauma is. Mm -hmm. And this is the first thing that is actually quite still unknown um, because it, these understandings have only emerged in the last 40 or 50 years of research and trauma work, um, which has been increasingly more and more biologically focused. What we're realizing is that trauma is not actually an event. Trauma is what happens inside our own body as a response to the event. And a perfect example for this is think of it like, you know, two people might be riding together in a car and they might get into a bit of a car wreck. Now, one of those people might walk away totally fine, no problems, able to drive around with confidence, you know, no worries. The other person may be after that filled with anxiety whenever they get in a car. They may fear driving in general. They may have a hard time uh, with their health following that in various ways. And it's the same event. They both had the same event. But so they had... trauma is not equal to, uh, to all people. That's right. That's right. It's what happens inside of us in response to an overwhelming or potentially overwhelming event is greatly determined by how our wiring was set up from the get-go. 
and I mean the wiring of our autonomic nervous system. So really the event is like a neutral thing that just happens to trigger a response within us. Is that right? Essentially. I mean, and there are certain things that no one could avoid being traumatic. All right. I mean, we have to be clear. There are, you know, being blown up, you know, in a war or like being sexually assaulted, being attacked physically. I mean, that's going to be traumatic for almost anybody. But then there's other things that can go either way, like, you know, a car, a minor car accident. And so mm -hmm. it's, you know, it is definitely a, it depends on what is happening already in the person and how are they set up for success or failure from a nervous mm. perspective. And a lot of that comes back to the early wiring, but I'll, I'll get into those details later. So Fantastic. fundamentally what we are saying trauma is, is when you are in an overwhelming experience, in an overwhelming and your survival responses get activated. And what I mean by that is the fight, flight, and freeze energies. These are autonomic responses, meaning automatic. Everyone is wired with them. Every mammal on the earth has the same autonomic survival responses of fight, flight, freeze. So just like the wolf or the bear or the hyena or the gazelle, we have those same survival responses. No matter how evolved we are spiritually, that response is the same. And that's really the foundation of understanding how to heal this is that it's in the mammalian nature. It's in understanding how to work with that physiology. So when a survival response is activated, our fight, flight, or freeze response, and because of whatever circumstances, it's not allowed to deactivate, it stays stuck in the system. And that is trauma. Mm -hmm. It's when we have what's called an incomplete survival response. So, like, um, so the equivalent thing that I'm thinking about is, you know, when you have your computer on and yeah. you've got too many programs opened at one time, it's like if each one of those programs was our response to some trauma, we'd be using all this brain power and all this body power and all this energy that we don't even know that we're using because it just keeps on this defrag cycle. Is it a bit like that? Very much so. What happens is, I mean, if you have one trauma, you know, that's going to, and, and that means you have one survival response that's stuck in your system. That can be relatively easy to resolve if you if you know about trauma and you get the right kind of support. But generally what happens is this starts very early on because of the nature of our society and what we call micro traumas that are normalized because of the toxicity of industrialized society. I mean, yeah. the hard pavement, the uneven surface, or the, the flat, even surfaces instead of variable terrain, just that. I mean, we evolved over millions of years walking and crawling and moving you know, through the bush and over the landscapes, right? Uh, the, the pace of modern society, the demands of it, the need to go, go, go in order to succeed. Uh, you know, the many things that we use to cope and manage the daily stressors. All of that adds up over time. So when one has been through a series of traumas or micro traumas and then have big events layered on top of that, over time, the life force energy gets all sucked into mm. keeping the survival responses managed. So and one, that, you have this- big, say, And that dynamic then creates something like complex PTSD or something that's similar to that. You got, you got it, yeah. And I'll, I'll explain a bit about how trauma shows up and the different kinds, but that's essentially it, is that our, our energy is, gone into ramping up these survival responses that never completed so they're still humming away in our system and then the body has to work to to manage the damage that that does because there's a high cost of doing business to living with survival energy running through the system mm -hmm. it's very taxing and we have less access to things like the rest digest repair state that allows our body to do its natural functions of repairing cells and all that stuff so not only is our energy zapped by all these survival energies, what energy we have left often goes into just managing that. Yeah. Right? Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah, it totally makes sense. And I'm also just wondering about the interaction with the individual itself because I know that some people are more sensitive than others. So there's going to be some people around who experience trauma more easily than what other people do. And I think one of the challenges with trauma work is that other people looking on 
can make judgments about people and they can say, how can they be traumatized? Because this, the only thing that happened was X, Y, and Z, and that's not a very big deal. You know, I, I just find that really fascinating, that whole kind of dialogue and connection. And we've just had a comment from someone that I'm just going to read out. So thank you, Patria, for this comment. A reaction is always in the body. A reaction is automatic. It's second nature to us. Whereas a response requires consideration. A response Mm -hmm. takes us in new directions. A reaction repeats what we've done before, which is what we're talking about. Yep. Cycle. Yep. It's useful to separate out our language around reaction and response. Absolutely. Reactions are unconscious and a response is conscious. And my thank you, Patria, that's a great mm-hmm. comment. My my understanding basically, Seth, is what your the work that you're doing in helping us to process trauma is what takes us between reaction to response. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. It's a brilliant way that she put it. Essentially, the trauma work is learning how to respond to the reactivity, right? Learning how to develop a conscious response so that we can intervene with these automatic reactions that are firing, firing, firing all the time. Yeah. Yeah. So poignant. Yeah, absolutely. So just, you know, I'll, I'll give a few examples of what I mean by stuck survival energy, just so people have a grounded understanding of what I'm talking about. Beautiful. Yeah. So say, say your fight flight response gets activated. That's the first thing that will get tripped in a normal a mammalian system. Something is happening that's potentially overwhelming. Our fight flight response comes up and that's the sympathetic nervous system that runs that show. And what that looks like if, if it gets stuck well, we will tend to see hypertension and chronic muscular tension, uh, things like uncontrollable rage or anxiety. I mean, basically think about if you have fight and flee running as a program round and around, how that would manifest. Um, Often we see things like um, lots of rashes and redness in the skin, heat in the body, uh, chronic high blood pressure, Um, And yes, anxiety, uh, chronic tension, all of these things are like manifestations of a system that is ramped up and prepared to fight or flee, but it doesn't know that that's happening. It's happening under the surface. So these are the representations we would see. Now, when fight and flight is unsuccessful, all mammals have a third response, which is freeze. And freeze is what comes on if fight and flight didn't work. And the system thinks, "Uh uh-oh, like I'm probably gonna die here. Um, Shut down, shut everything down, restrict the blood flow to the limbs. Let's dissociate um, from the experience. We numb out. It's all to protect the the psyche essentially from the pain of death. I mean, these these responses we have to remember, they developed in the wild um, through, you know, wild interactions. Um, And the stressors that we face today are far more nuanced and subtle than like being hunted by a lion or something. But the same responses get perked up. So if the freeze response gets perked up and we have, say, you know, something happened to us, we couldn't fight it, we couldn't flee, and then we collapse or we freeze in shock. If that stays stuck in our system, we tend to see things like collapse, depression, Uh, dissociation, chronic low blood pressure, uh, numbness in the limbs, lethargy, um, a lack of purpose, a lack of drive. Essentially, you have this signaling going on in the body that is saying we're about to die. And when that's running along under the surface, you get all those types of manifestations that are kind of in that camp. And what happens when both are in the picture is we get what's called, you know, and we get all of the previous things, and then you start getting things, what we call syndromes. So these would be pretty much every autoimmune condition, cancers, um, things like chronic fatigue, irritable bowel, chronic conditions that are basically a result of the wiring being crossed essentially you have the gas on all the way and you have the brake on all the way and both those things are happening at the same time in the system underneath the surface and when that's going on it's in the autonomic nervous system and we have to remember that the autonomic nervous system is connected to all of our systems it's what runs the show in addition to managing these fight flight freeze responses it governs our heart rate it governs our breath 
It governs our digestion, our immune responses. So when the fight, flight, freeze survival energies are taking up all the bandwidth, the autonomic nervous system has a hard time doing what it's supposed to do. And we end up with all of these experiences. So that is generally a broad spectrum sort of picture of the kind of things that I see in my clients and the things that we work to resolve uh, when we're doing this trauma work. I hope that's all making sense. Yeah, that is totally making sense. And I think that it puts so much into perspective of understanding how it all operates. And I think that um, when you, you know, when you talk about it that way, it makes me understand how how causal trauma mm. is to our well-being and the lack of processing causing di disease and illness. And it's fascinating to me that so many people don't understand this work. Mm -hmm. is, no, this it's, like, is this like fairly new or have people known this forever or is this like groundbreaking or what, what's going on here? It, it's relatively new. So this work was developed first by Peter Levine. Um, he's a man who started looking into this in the late 60s, early 70s. Uh, he was primarily into biology. Um, but also was kind of part of the, he was in California, he was in Berkeley during the 60s and 70s and sort of the emergent consciousness uh, field that was happening at that time where there was lots of workshops and stuff going on, different subjects, right? So he was into all that stuff. He was into shamanism, he was into biology, uh, he was into consciousness. And he asked the question one day, how come animals in the wild don't become traumatized? Like they're hunted and stalked and, you know, on a daily basis, but they're not traumatized. They either are eaten or they're fine, right? What a fascinating observation. <laughs> yeah. And so he's like, well, what's up with that? We have the same nervous system. We really do. And we, our brain is different than other mammals. That's what sets us apart is we have a neocortex. Apart from that, we're the same. We have the same brain, the Perhaps same. We shouldn't. Perhaps we shouldn't have a neocortex and that's. Well, it's like it gets us in trouble. And actually I'd like to, that's a great point because you know, one thing that you might want to ask is like, how come, how come these things get stuck? Right? Why, why does the survival response get stuck in the system? some cases it's unavoidable like say you know i'm walking along the street and a bike comes along and knocks me over and i get knocked unconscious well like my body will have responded even though it was faster than i could process it would have seen the bike i would have gone into a fight flight response my arms would have wanted to come up to protect me but then i was knocked unconscious before any of that happened all those responses are still stuck in the system just because it happened too fast. Yeah. And that, that's, that's one way that trauma happens commonly is it's too much too fast. For so the is, system there different, is there different um, levels of trauma or grades of trauma or a way that you kind of group it? Yes. What mm -hmm. I just described is called a shock trauma. It's what happens when some big insult or injury comes along and it happened faster than we were able to process. Um, where and that's distinct from like early developmental trauma, which is more like a series of chronic stressors. So for example, you know, a little one growing up simply in a home where mom and dad are stressed all the time. And, you know, maybe they don't like each other that much, but they don't talk about it. And they're both have various addictions that they're managing in order to get through the day. And dad, you know, yells easily or you know he believes in things that have been normalized like spanking you no know, just that is enough to seriously traumatize a person mm -hmm. even though it's relatively <laughs> normal right yeah and and if, on that, if you take that example most people in my experience i've talked about the idea of spanking to a lot of people because i chose not to spank my own two my own two Good on you. So this has been a conscious conversation that i've had with people and the majority of people believe they have not been affected by smacking. But to me, that just shows how out of touch with their own body they actually are. You got it. That's the thing. I and mean, we live in a world that depends essentially on trauma to run. And that's how embedded it is. We, 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 the, the structure of society revolves around keeping people in survival mode. So, you know, it's it's institutionalized. It's because of the, I think, someone somewhere, whoever's, you know, controlling the way that the world works, you can have various theories on that, but someone somewhere seems to have this vested interest in keeping people in fear and not allowing abundance and love to reign. 
Exactly. Because when you keep people in survival mode, you keep them from accessing their higher consciousness. You keep them from accessing their critical thought. Right? So can you answer me this question? If someone is has a desire to become more conscious and to have a higher vibration, is the trauma that they have that is unresolved holding them back from those goals? Yes, but they may not know that. And actually, I'd love to tell a bit of a story to explain that if I could. Yeah, please do. Please do. So when I was in my early 20s, um, I had my what I would call an awakening experience. Up to that point, I had just been sort of a normal kid growing up in suburbia. Um, but after college, I'm in college, I started exploring consciousness. I used uh, mushrooms a couple times and like, you know, took it as a very religious or spiritual experience. Um, that started to open things up in my mind. But in my early 20s, I did my first 10 day Vipassana retreat. And if people don't know what that is, it's the technique of self observation that Buddha taught, where you're basically just tracking your bodily experience, your sensations. Um, in do when I was in that 10 day retreat, I had uh, an awakening experience. I remembered these past lives that came just flooding in of sitting in these halls and doing this practice. And I took to the practice like a fish to water. Like I just, I loved it. It was no problem. It wasn't hard. I loved it. Like I wanted to stay in silence after the 10 days were up. I was like, I don't want to go back to the world. This is great. You know, <laughs> uh, just sitting and feeling myself meditate. Like I loved it. And I started very quickly developing these sort of spiritual abilities where I was accessing my etheric energy in big ways. And I would say the following 14, 15 years continued in that vein. I eventually, you know, shortly after that Vipassana retreat, I sold all my belongings. I bought a one-way ticket to Hawaii with about 300 bucks in my pocket. And I was no idea how I would, you know, survive or anything. And I just, you know, trusted spirit to guide me, did the whole vagabond thing, just camping around, meditating on beaches, talking to different people, learning different kinds of energy work, developing consciousness. And all of that was great. And it didn't touch my trauma whatsoever. Yeah. So what happened is I ended up being this very sensitive, empathic, person with a lot of spiritual ability as long as I was in the woods. If I left the woods and went into the world, I would become an anxious wreck within the matter of a couple hours. The integration hadn't happened. No, it's because my etheric spiritual energy abilities were not grounded in a regulated nervous system. So mm -hmm. I would go into the world and the fluorescent lights would, you know, cause me tremendous anxiety. The the hardness of the, the world, the sounds, the, the number of people. I could only last a couple hours. I would take little trips into town and then I would go back to the woods. And that's how I lived for about 15 years. Wow. Uh, mostly in the woods in little, either by myself or in little communities. And it wasn't until I discovered this work through meeting my wife that I realized how much I didn't know that I didn't know. And I think you've just so beautifully outlined the gap that a lot of spiritual people have, you know, yes. including myself. I would include that very much in that I've got a lot of different traumas that I've had in my own life, but um, I've done a lot of work on them, don't get me wrong, but I yes. still think they're in there defragging away, you know, doing, doing their kind of dirty work and preventing me from able, from me being able to be as conscious as I would like or as evolved as I would like or my vibration being where I would like it to be. Someone has a question that I just want to um, share with you. Sure. If a trauma is bad enough to be erased from conscious memory, so it only keeps coming up in dreams along with that freeze feeling, how do we bring it to a conscious state to be able to heal it? What a fantastic question. Great question. Yeah. So this is why the, the best work for resolving trauma that, in my opinion, is somatic work, because you don't need to remember in a declarative way what happened. The body knows. The body remembers. And what happens generally is when we turn our attention and our intention towards addressing the somatic level of, of trauma, that the, it starts to speak we start to become more familiar with the sensations of these experiences. So even though you may not remember it, 
you may start to get these feelings, sensations, and emotions out of the blue that are that memory. It's just, it's a body memory. So if, if we can be specific to this person, some of the kinds of things that you can do in terms of somatic body work might be something like massage therapy or it might be chiropractic or osteopathic work or there's a whole range of different body workers that you can actually go to that and this is what I found really helpful in my journey is it's been the body workers that have been the most able to help me to release some of that trauma and integrate it and process it if I go to the psychologist or the counselor or the psychiatrist I'm less able to do that because I'm in my prefrontal cortex the whole time and it gets in my way Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Um, body workers can be very powerful um, as a facilitator for helping this stuff emerge because it is literally in the tissues. The issues are in the tissues, as we say. Um, that being said, sometimes that can be dangerous because sometimes stuff can get unlocked that we're not ready for. So the work that I do is equal parts education and also guided helping people guide them through their own system the whole foundation of the somatic trauma work is that it's kind of like you know how in the past in in tribal societies shamans would someone who was suffering the shaman would go in and they would go into the astral plane and they would work essentially with the person's subconscious or unconscious in that arena and they would do the work of soul retrieval and do the work of soul repair well, this work is about teaching people to do that for themselves in a conscious state by learning the language of the trauma physiology and how it speaks and what it means. So that when they're having these tremblings or shaking or chronic aches or even thought loops that are representation of such things, they learn how to go into the body in a safe way to allow them to release. And one of the principles that's really important in this work is understanding that we have the innate ability to release this trauma. That's why animals in the wild don't get traumatized. They don't have all the societal conditioning. They don't have the prefrontal cortex. Can I, so, can I ask a question about the, the physiology of trauma? Is the physiology of trauma the same regardless of what the cause is? And I'm asking this because mm -hmm. the same person that asked the other question is, is talking about sexual assault while asleep as a child. Mm -hmm. So my, my comment about that is whether it's sexual assault or whether it's a, an accident that you've had or whether it's someone holding a gun to your head, does the body do the same thing anyway, regardless of what the initial trigger has been? In most cases, yes. Um, there may be nuance in terms of the response, but yes, it's all the same. Um, and this is another thing that's not understood, that you can have the same sort of symptoms of trauma from being in a war as from being in a chronically stressful job where you get yelled at all the time. Same. And it may not seem, this is where we get into things like, oh, I haven't been through anything. I haven't been through anything tough. Um, it's just because, like I said, so much and has been normalized. Can you, can you please specifically talk to the relationship of trauma and mental illness and different diagnoses that people end up with? Yeah. Basically, we view all mental illness as a representation of trauma. As it's what happens when the survival physiology shows up in the mind. So take, for example, OCD. The perfect example. What is that except for the system constantly scanning for threat and then developing organizational routines to help manage that? Right? It's the underneath the behaviors that are these ways of managing and coping is this constant signal saying danger, 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 danger. That's in the physiology. Or with depression, we that's just an expression of the freeze response. The freeze response is telling you you're gonna die. There's no point to doing anything. It makes everything numb. It takes away the circulation from the limbs, so it's harder to be active. And you have depression, where it's just, oh, there's no point. I don't have any energy. I don't want to do anything. Right? That's, that is the representation of the freeze response. Um, so we go so far as to say that trauma is the cause of mental illness. Absolutely. I would not only say that, I would say trauma is the cause of most physical illness. There are some things that are true genetic disorders um, where there's a gene sequence missing. But from what we know from epigenetics is that most of 
the expressions of gene, it's about potential. We're all born with genetic potentialities, both positive and maladaptive. And the environment that we are in as we're growing up and the environment that's in our body, the chemistry, determines which of those gene sequences is going to be potentiated. So yeah. it's And it's, I think I think if I can just add to that, it's it's the environment around us that allows our genes to be turned on, but also turned off. Turn off. Exactly. When you, when you think about the power of your environment being able to turn your genes on or off, that's that's incredible because then you start asking questions about what my surroundings are like, what my relationships are like, what my workplace is like, what my life is like. Am I making decisions that are truly helping me to optimize my own life or am I my own worst problem? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yep. Yep. And that's, that actually is a nice segue into starting to talk about things that we need to do in order to heal at this level. Right. Yeah. So the, the foundation is safety. If we are in a home situation that is not safe, it'll be very difficult to heal. It'll actually be impossible. You can make some progress. You can develop some capacity. You can learn about setting boundaries. But your home environment has to feel safe. It's not enough to tell yourself that you're safe. You have to feel safe at a cellular level. You have to feel safe to express yourself. You have to feel safe to be authentic. So that is one of the very first foundations to look at. Are your relationships safe? Can you be yourself? Can you cry? Can you get angry? Can you have all your emotions? If not, it'll be very difficult to do this work because the fundamental nature of trauma healing is cultivating the emergence of authenticity, who we truly are underneath all those survival responses that are running away in our system. But, but I think one, one of the challenges with that is just the reality that, you know, it's actually my belief that everyone is traumatized. Every yeah. single human in some way, shape or form is yeah. deeply traumatized. And so when you pose the question of one person being in a family and being able to feel safe and to be able to resolve their trauma, you're assuming that everyone else in the family doesn't have trauma themselves. <laughs> this is the case. No, Which isn't the case. We're, yeah. we're, we're all in it together, you know? Mm -hmm. That's right. And it's about finding people who are harmonious with you. It's not about finding someone who has no damage because, yes, that basically doesn't exist. It's about finding someone who can be on the same page with you, who is like, yes, we are both screwed up. Let's let's be allies. Right. Yeah. yeah. And so, yeah, it's not about having to have people who are healthy and healed around you, like and perfect. It's about having people who are harmonious, who are of a like vibration, who can support each other in being authentic and expressing themselves. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's about doing your best to cultivate those relationships that support that and pruning away the ones where you have to put on a mask, you have to put on a phony face, or you're always, you know, the one who's doing the caretaking, or you never feel like you can fully express yourself. Those relationships probably need to be pruned away so this we can make room for other ones. Let's just do a quick check in with everyone who's listening. Anyone who is listening, please drop into the comment box one word about how you're finding this conversation so far. And also, if you have a question for us, please don't hesitate to put it in. We've got about 10 minutes left. To oh come boy. Up through. That'll be time for a couple more questions. So please go ahead and ask whatever it is that you need of Seth today. Mm -hmm. So let me, yeah, as that's coming in, let me just go quickly over the rest of the thing. So foundational safety. We have to feel safe enough to be ourselves. We need education. We need to learn about trauma physiology and what it happens when it shows up so that we understand what's happening inside of us. So much relief can be got just from realizing it's not in my head. Like so many people are gaslit constantly by the medical system. It's all in your head. No, it's not. It's in your body and it's real. So that is education is so important to so people can realize, oh, that's why I experienced this crazy symptom or sensation. And then we need this, the practical tools. We need the kind of somatic tools that help us work with the physiology essentially working with trauma physiology learnings how to be with all the sensations of fear and overwhelm without becoming overwhelmed you have to learn how to be with the fear without fearing it 
-hmm. And that takes practice and it takes education, right? That's part of why we need to learn right? Like this is, oh, instead of, oh my God, I'm going crazy. It's, oh, I have a big fight flight response coming up and it's making my shoulders tense. And like, I need to like, look around for like, where's the safety? Like, yeah, I and you know, what's happening, right? In the last conversation, we were talking about triggering and how triggering is the access for you to be able to heal your shadow. That's right. That's and right. basically trauma is when we talk about triggering, that's what we're actually triggering. We're triggering the trauma. Right. <laughs> the reason you're triggered. You're triggered is because there's a trauma lodge somewhere in your body that you don't know about. That's, that's why right. you're triggered. That's right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Some the people other... are just saying um, very insightful, amazing, very helpful, re really safety and brilliant and enlightening. So we're on the right track. And I'll just yeah. encourage people, if you do have a question, please opt in and ask it now. Um, the more questions, the better. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, you know, the, another thing that's really helpful in the process of healing is support. So people can go to um, my, the basis of my work is the modality called somatic experiencing. So whatever your country in country you're in, just look up somatic experiencing and find a practitioner. Um, there's different um, SE organizations in Australia, in the states, in Europe, and they have directories for practitioners. However, um, just a sec, Nada, yeah. can you just put somatic experiencing in the comments for us, please? Thanks. Yeah. Um, and the thing is, this is still relatively new work, as I said, last 40 or 50 years. So the people who are trained in it is still relatively small compared to the number of psychologists and psychiatrists and counselors. So my wife, Irene, she used to be in private practice like me. And then she decided I can't help enough people this way. So she has created an entire suite of online resources from an amazing YouTube channel that's got so much education along with practical exercises and her website with her blog, as well as online programs ranging from a monthly drop-in class all the way to an intensive 12 week program we do once a year. Um, and again, I sent, um, I, I sent you links for all of those things. Um, so we can maybe put those up for people. Uh, yeah, so just so everyone knows, they, when you registered for the summit and gave us your email address, we're going to send out all those resources to your email address so you ha won't have to worry about keeping track or anything. Yeah. So that's, that's what I really recommend people start with. I mean, I'm in private practice, and when I'm not doing that, I'm helping Irene with the online business and supporting clients in there. And that is such a beautiful way to start this work. Um, particularly because it is online. A lot of people with trauma have a hard time just meeting new people or new practitioners, and not all practitioners are created equal or necessarily the best. So if you can get a solid education under your belt first, go to Irene's YouTube channel and just soak in all the education. Learn about this stuff. It'll make you much more informed if you want to do private work. And do you do your private work online, or does it have to be face-to-face? -face? I do. Yeah, I work with people all over the world. Um, unfortunately, my practice is closed because I have such a long wait list at this point that I can't take any more people on. Um, so that's why I refer people to the somatic experiencing directories or to Irene's work. Um, that really is the best way. Um, but yeah, I work online with people. You can totally do this work via video chat. Um, you definitely need to be able to see each other's faces. At, you know, that is a minimum uh, for that sort of social engagement. Uh, but yes, yeah, it can absolutely be done online. Fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you. Now we've got about five minutes left. So what would you find uh, the most important things that you want to leave people with in this conversation? Okay. Um, well, if there's any questions, uh, totally welcome to answer those. Um, but I'll just sort of go over the basics again, because like it's I just sort of downloaded a lot. <laughs> so, yeah. And it's complex. It is complex because we're complex beings. So trauma is something that happens in your body as a response to an overwhelming event. When your fight, flight or freeze energies get activated and they are not allowed to deactivate, they get stuck in the system and they produce a multitude of responses that show up in the physiology, in the mind, in the emotions, in the behaviors, and in relationships. It affects everything. That's point number one to really understand. It's in the body, but it affects all levels. 
that we need to work, learn about this stuff, to learn about our physiology and stress physiology. We need to have safe relationships. We need to have support and we need to have practical tools in order to heal at this level. We need to learn the language of the nervous system and understand how to respond to these things when they rear up inside of us and understand what's happening. So those are the sort of two broad points. Another thing that I didn't actually speak much about, um, but was just a, a few things of just how, how embedded into society this is. So, you know, going talking about what we call, uh, what Gabor Maté um, calls the toxic norm, right? It, like that old quote, uh, it is no sign of enlightenment to be well adjusted to a toxic society, or I think it was from Krishnamurti, something along those lines, right? Like <laughs> so functional in this world is to be traumatized because the world depends on your survival energy to keep this crazy system going. Right now, I think that system is breaking down. And because that's happening, because of the underlying energy that is arising in the field, we're seeing the existing power structure scrabble for dear life oh. to hold on. Right. That's right. And that's what we're seeing right now in the world is the, the last survival grasp of that system. So hang in there, learn about trauma, learn about how to work with your physiology. And it's sort of about at this point, out creating the system, learn how to become your own medicine so that you're not dependent on the toxic systems of society to heal. Cause we all have it in us. We all have the innate ability to heal baked into our genes, baked into our DNA. It's all in there. We just need the right education, the right tools, the right support. And what a beautiful way to end is on the potential that everybody has to heal themselves. And Absolutely. that has been a core theme throughout the entire summit. People have been coming at it from different angles, different perspectives, but at the end of the day, every single one of us is able to become whole. That's right. Absolutely. We, that's the first thing you learn in, when you go into an SE training. The first thing you learn in a session is to hold the intention that your client has the innate ability to heal. Mm. That's the foundation of all of it. That's yeah. why animals in the wild don't get traumatized. They don't it's, have that energetic, it's that energetic connection that you have with the other person and your belief in that other person that creates the container for that creates transformation and alchemy to occur. You got Beautiful. it. Thank you, you so much, Seth Lyon. There's so many thank yous that I need to give you this morning and so many epiphanies as well in your conversation as we've gone through. For everyone who has been listening, I'm sure you will not be the same after hearing this man speak. And if you have only listened yourself and you've got other people that you would like to refer this conversation and this talk to, you'll find this talk live up on YouTube or record it on YouTube and you'll be able to use that talk and forward it to as many people as you would like. So thank you so much. We now have a one hour break and we're back again at one o'clock with AJ and Siddhi Shakti, who is going to be doing some beautiful sound healing work with us. And if you haven't seen Siddhi Shakti before, it's a great opportunity to really connect into something that's a little bit different um, and learning how you resonate and how your energy works through sound. And people are saying, thank you. How amazing. Lots of great comments in the comment box. So right. the other thing to remember is that AJ and I are running our superhuman experience, which starts on the 3rd of May, and we would love you to be a part of it. And everything that we are talking about in the summit gets covered within the superhuman experience, just in a smaller, more close-knit kind of a group. So we'd encourage you to be part of that. Um, until uh, 1 o'clock, we'll see you soon. Thanks again, Seth. Appreciate it. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye.